We're back on the road to City Hall. My next guest served in the City Council from 2002 to 2009, representing Forest Hills, Regal Park, Kew Gardens in Queens. And in 2009, she came up short in a run for city controller. Now she's back on the campaign trail, attempting to become the next Queensboro president. We welcome Melinda Katz back to the program. Good to see you. Good to see you, Earl, as and, always. And I should mention, you uh, before City Council, you spent five years in the State Assembly. I did. I spent five years up in Albany. Yeah, which almost answers the question. But my first question would be, like, what, why do you want to go back to this stuff? <laughs> Actually, I love serving the public. I spent most of my adult life uh, in elected office. And, you know, since I served in the New York State Assembly and was director of community boards and in the New York City Council, um, I have the experience throughout the entire borough. Um, and I do think the next borough president has to have a real vision of what they see for the borough of Queens. And not only to have that vision, but the ability to advance that vision. And many people always ask me, well, how can the borough president advance the vision? What is it that they actually do? Yes, and please tell me with regard to the <laughs> actual powers of the borough presidency. I've heard a lot of borough president, president candidates talk about all kinds of stuff that they're going to do that has nothing to do with the office. What, 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 are, your, what are your plans? Well, I think that's right. But you do have to remember that according to the 89 uh, charter revision, the borough president does have 5% of the capital budget that they can disseminate throughout the borough of Queens for city projects. Mm. Uh, they're in charge of the borough district cabinet, which brings all of the agencies from throughout the borough together. And it helps to be a bully pulpit for the Department of Buildings, for schools, for the Department of Transportation to make sure that we're getting uh, equal funding. Um, and they also have the borough board, which does a lot of the land use issues, which remember, I was chair of the land use committee um, for eight years. Um, so that's really how you can advance an agenda. And I do think the borough president needs to have that experience to, number one, create jobs uh, in the borough of Queens, but also protect communities and the small neighborhoods that people love. So of the, the land use issues that are out there, I mean, I hear about Willits Point and I hear about possible expansion of the tennis center and I hear about Hunter's Point, and I usually hear about this in connection with protests, disputes, lawsuits, and right. so forth. What, what's your vision? How do you how do you negotiate all of that stuff? Well, the vision truly is to figure out what's good for the overall borough, and I think part of those issues is putting together the people who are affected, and the communities are the number one folks that are affected by all of these land use projects throughout the borough of Queens. And by the way, what affects one community may very well affect another one. And you need to put those parties together. Um, as part of the ULOR process, the borough president's able to be part of that process and be an advisory role as they go through that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's other issues that come up with land use. One is school sightings. And some of um, people are coming from all over the entire world to educate their children right here in the borough of Queens, either from all over the world or second and third generation. But we need to make sure that those families stay in our borough. And there's so many issues going on with schools like co-location uh, and charter school issues that we need to make sure that the schools that are cited are used properly for the kids of Queens. Well, I mean, for, fortunately for you, you've um, been out of office when a lot of this, this fighting over co-locations reached its sort of um, insane pitch. What, right. What, what is, what's your thinking about co-locations? Except, co except that, you know, I put out statements, even though I have not been in office, on co-location. I actually stopped a co-location in my district for Halsey Junior High School, and the argument I made then still stands today. If the Department of Education put the resources and put the assets into those schools and sent in the expertise needed in order to revamp a lot of the schools that they want to co-locate, then the Department of Education would be a better place to send their children. But co-locating schools simply crushes a lot of the kids down, um, adds another principal, another administration, other teachers into the same building. And it's not doing justice to what I think that we are capable of doing. When um, I think about Queens and, I, I, and schools, I think about places like Bayside where they've got yeah. like really good schools and they have, they have for a long, long time. Is there some some role for the borough president in trying to make sure that the excellence of those schools is both not lost but even spread throughout the borough? You know, when borough president Claire Shulman was the borough president, I worked for her and I was trained under her for over th for three years. Um, and one of the things that she did is she had a war room where she would go over every single school in the borough with the Department of Education, with DOT for, for transportation issues, with the police, with the fire department, with every one of the affected agencies, with SCA. And she would go over, all right, this is an overcrowded school. Where are we going to put those children? Let's see if we can lease space. And she would go over that month by month by month. I think the secret to that is to stay on top of it, 
The secret to that is also using your expertise on land use that when they want to build huge residential communities or even add to the residential communities that are there, we need to make sure that we have appropriate schools in order to service those kids. Mm -hmm. in, in, in parts of Queens I, that we've visited, we've visit, been visiting a lot of uh, city council districts and, and out in southeast Queens in particular, where they've had a drainage problem since forever, where they've had some development issues since forever, where they have sort of the worst commute, I think, in the whole United States, one of the longer commutes in the whole country, uh, trying to get from, you know, Hollis or someplace um, um, into the city. Are, are there transportation infrastructure type projects that you would be wanting to take on? Because there's, there's a lot going on there and in, in, you know, Roosevelt Avenue, Jackson Avenue, a lot of stuff going on. Right, and when I was chair of the Land Use Committee, um, one of the things we did was rezone the Jamaica area, and the hub of that mm -hmm. was where the train to the plane leads into the community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the borough president can be key on is making sure that we are building where it's appropriate and keeping the jobs in the neighborhoods as well, and also making sure that clearly things are built well with the trades as well. Um, but also protecting the surrounding communities. So it is important to have the transportation so people can get in and out of the borough should they choose, but also create the jobs there so that if they want to stay there, work there, raise their family in the borough, that they don't have to go over a bridge or under a tunnel in order to achieve that. You should be able to do that all in the borough of Queens. And, and la last question, which is probably the biggest thing you or anybody else who's borough president of Queens is going to have to deal with, which is uh, the aftermath of Sandy. Yes. Um, what's your take on how things have gone so far and what direction would you take it in if elected? I think the community feels, and I've been out there several times, in fact I'm going out there tonight to the community board meeting, feels that they're not being listened to and they feel like, and I'm not sure they're wrong, that a lot of their desires and a lot of their interests uh, in the community are not being listened to very closely. I do know that the city is hoping to be open by Memorial Day so that um, when folks come out there like I did as a child all the time and many of my friends to go out to the beach and to um, the areas out there, that it's at least ready, it's protected and it's ready and that there's a pedestrian walk Way. But I think the key issue is the same as it is in most neighborhoods. Folks need to be listened to. Communities need, need a seat at the table. When the borough president goes to the other cities, the other uh, boroughs, and they fight for resources to come into this borough, they need to be able to fight from a position of strength. And that strength comes from every single individual community having a seat at the table, and then the borough president being able to speak as one voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are going to leave it there for now. We'll wish you the best of luck. You're out there in a field of, I don't know, last time I checked, about seven people. That and, is true. And um, maybe we'll see you at some debates and elsewhere on the campaign trail. Thanks a whole lot. I would like that. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a short break. Still to come, we'll discuss a new report that explores why young women, not Melinda Katz, don't want to pursue elected office. We're going to be talking with the author of a report called Girls Just Want to Not Run. That's right after the break. Stay with us.